and everything was great. I was cash flowing. I was super happy. I had great tenants. Like it was like check mark. I'm thinking, oh yes, I've got this. I've got this real estate game. But then I get a letter from the city saying that your place is illegal. I have two choices here. Am I going to quit after, after this one happened or am I going to keep moving forward? Welcome back to the show, Crafted Entrepreneurs. In this episode, we have Mel Dupuis on the podcast. Mel and her husband, Dave, are known as the investor couple, and they actually specialize in helping people buy investment properties without spending their own money. Uh, Mel shares how she went from working multiple jobs to buying buildings the following year and what she wishes she would have known when she got started as a real estate investor. We're also going to discuss how she built this incredible education company that's helping students all over the place get into real estate. So over the past 20 years, she's been able to create incredible freedom in her life and she's really gone all in on multifamily real estate. So I'm excited to talk all of the things, not just real estate investing, but how do you build an education company and be a mom and a wife at the same time? So welcome Mel to the show. Hey, Kayla. So great to see you again. Yay. Okay. So, you know, I know you weren't always buying buildings and teaching other people how to buy buildings. What were you doing? You know, when you first got out of high school, what what did you get yourself into? Yes. Well, at first I was, I was in sales and in marketing and I got a a job at, at our local college, which was fantastic. And I thought I made it right. I have the pension, I have benefits and, and that was fantastic. And I had a lot of fun for many, many years. And then part of me wanted more. I, you know, so I, so I thought, okay, well, I'm going to do the next best thing. So I started working all the time because I knew you could grow. If I grew my portfolio, right. A lot of people get wealthy through real estate. So I knew that if I did that, I could somehow get there, but I had no clue how to do it. So I got to work. I I took on teaching part-time at a local college. I was teaching part-time fitness classes as well. And I was saving enough time over time to, to buy one property here, another one. So I had a couple of properties. Then I met, I met Dave and we decided to keep going on this journey together. So he did the same thing. He started working all the time as well. He's a firefighter um, and he took on other jobs. And then we realized that we're barely any further ahead and we're just burning ourselves, right? Just working, working, working. And we read Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki, the common uh, book in, in real estate. And although it didn't show us how to do it, it gave us that complete mindset shift that, OMG, we are doing this completely wrong. We're working all the time. We're burning ourselves instead of just putting money to work for us. And that was a game changer. So we interviewed those who were successful in the creative financing world, using other people's money to grow their portfolio, and also those who failed. And that's when the next year we were able to buy 12 properties in 12 months. And that was the, they're all multifamily properties, um, solely owned as well. And it was a, a game changer in, in my life. The next year I was able to quit my full-time job. Wow. Okay. That was like a lot happening. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Because there's so much that has to happen when it comes to thinking differently about the possibilities for your life, right? So you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And your husband happened to be on the same page as you, which is amazing. I feel like that is like a total blessing right there that he's like, yeah, <laughs> let's go do this. Yeah. When I first met him, Kayla, that's, he said, it said, I'm going to be a millionaire someday. And I thought, that's impressive. I've never had somebody tell me that before. So, and he was confident, but had no clue and had a lot of fear um, about investing as well. So how did you guys get into the rooms to, like you said, you were started interviewing people who were in the creative financing space. How did you even you know, get in those rooms to ask them those questions. Yeah, it was just, you know, through some of it was through connections. Some of them I I knew they were currently investing. So it was just easy as saying, hey, I'm a brand new investor. Can you please give me an hour of your time? I have some questions for you. And and it's just my network kind of built from there. And it happened over quite a few months. And I was just able to ask, you know, what went really wrong? And do you know anybody who failed? And, you know, it was all those kind of things. And it had the, the domino effect. So I could really learn from those who were successful, but those who made mistakes as well. And of course, we've all made mistakes and many people are willing to, to share their mistakes so people can learn from them as well. 
Well, that's what I find is that truly successful people don't gatekeep what works. They really give it all out there and say, hey, here's what works. And they are open to sharing their failures, you know, if it could just help one person. So that's amazing that you knew to go and do that. Because I, I mean, I don't know if I would have known to do that had I not like (laughs) uh, started investing in myself a few years back, you know? So I love that you you guys went that route and really, I'm sure it shortcutted the process for you guys. Would you say? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So how did you know you wanted to do multifamily? Because in Rich Dad, Poor Dad, you know, he does talk a lot about the mindset. And I think that is a classic book. If those of you listening in right now have not read that book, I'm going to highly recommend it again because it's such an easy read and it can really change your life. I know it changed mine too. So Mel, like what was it that was like multifamily is it? For me, I, I didn't have a lot of money and I knew that if, what if, right? I always thought, okay, if I'm going to do get into this, what if a tenant doesn't pay or what if something goes wrong? So going after very large multifamily was definitely out of the question back then because I had way too much fear and I didn't have a lot of money. Getting into single dwellings, I did have the fear that if that one tenant doesn't pay me, that I'm not going to have any income and it's not sustainable. However, with a duplex or a triplex, if a tenant doesn't pay me, at least I still have some cash flow covering the majority, if not all of my expenses. So that's why I started going into the multifamily route to start. I love that. Okay. So tell me about your first multifamily deal. My first one was a duplex and I was so excited for it. I purchased it and it was, there was an upstairs and an unfinished basement. And I thought I was extremely brilliant. I thought I'm going to put it downstairs, one bedroom, a bachelor apartment and going to rent it out. It's going to increase in value and everything's going to be perfect. So I mean, it was at, at the beginning. So I rented the upstairs, downstairs, did renovations and rented it out to, to a tenant and everything was great. I was cash flowing. I was super happy. I had great tenants. Like it was like check mark. I'm thinking, oh yes, I've got this. I've got this real estate game. But then I get a letter from the city saying that your place is illegal because I didn't know what I didn't know back then. Not allowed to have two um, different apartments within that municipality. And I had to shut down the one basement. I converted back to single dwelling and had to sell it because it just didn't make financial sense. So it was a bit of a mistake. And at that point, of course, it was a bit frustrating. And I thought, oh, you know, I have two choices here. Am I going to quit after, after this one happened or am I going to keep moving forward. But I did continue, of course, to learn from that mistake. And now I know I understand zoning and that I need to check up on it before getting into the property and, and really working as well with investor focused agents as well. Yeah. So I think that's amazing that you, you looked at the mistake you made and you go, okay, what can I learn from it? And you really kind of just kept going. So many people get stuck at the, oh, it didn't work out. I'm an idiot. They'll, they'll say to themselves and, you know, this isn't, I'm not cut out for this. How did you have that grittiness? Because that doesn't just come one time. I mean, you've had to have failed a lot in your life to go, okay, I'm just going to keep going because I know eventually I'm going to figure this thing out. What got you to that spot in your mindset? Yeah. And, and to be clear, it wasn't like, oh, the moment I got the letter, I'm like, oh, I've got this and, and move along. Right. So, yeah, of course, I had some tears and I was upset. And and then I thought, well, maybe there's an opportunity here. So what if I, I sell the property and I crunch some numbers and what if I mean, and I actually was able to make a little bit of profit and 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 learn and just realizing that, OK, I made a mistake on this property. I'm still I think I broke even or made a little bit of profit off it. Not bad. And then what if I do the same thing, but I check the zoning next time, right? Because I was cash flowing everything and was going well. I had good tenants. So I think it was really just realizing that and, and absolutely failure. Uh, if we, we failed a lot of times throughout the years, made a lot of mistakes and, and realizing that I have two choices and you really do have two choices. It's to keep going or, or stop and keep going and, and learn or just stop. And I think a very naturally growth driven and, and, and of course, a mindset stuff as well, Kayla, along the way, right? 10X by Grant Cardone, who, which allowed me to think big when everybody was telling me I was crazy. And those kind of things really helped along the way as well. It's awesome. I mean, th- there's so much power in books and podcasts and all, a lot of like basically free resources that you could get out there. I think Grant gives out his books for free now. And, you know, he's like, you pay shipping or something like that. But there is so much that you could do by just like learning how the greats think. And if you could just adopt that mindset, you realize like it's usually you've got to think 
opposite of what your friends are saying, what your family's saying, and you got to do what the greats do if you want to be great. So that's amazing that you're able to just push through. At what point did you go, okay, we should start teaching this to other people. There's, you know, money to be made in that industry. Well, great question. And it didn't really happen that way at all. Oh. In fact, it's funny when I was saying how I reached out to other people and most people wanted to share information. I was not one of those people. I had the scarcity mindset. So after we, and during we bought the 12 and 12, I wasn't telling anyone how to do this. Like my mom had asked me, Mel, how are you buying all these properties? Is it legal? I'm like, don't worry about it, mom. Everything's legal. But, you know, I didn't tell her because I was so afraid that the word would get out and there'd be less buildings or less money for me. And it was in 2018. So the following year, we're actually on our way to a real estate investing uh, conference. And we were in a horrific car crash. It was a rollover crash on the highway. It was a careless transport driver. Um, he was driving between lanes quickly. He hit a vehicle who hit us. We hit the guardrail and we rolled across the highway four times. We landed upside down. The vehicle landed upside down. And it was one of the scariest moments, of course, of, of my life. And as we're rolling, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm dying. I have three kids. I'm never going to see them again. They're never going to see Dave again. But luckily, we did survive. And, and we were transported by ambulance at the hospital and just, you know, going through a million different emotions, of course, going through that and, and thinking about our kids and, and thinking about our future and thinking about um, how grateful we are that we survived. And, and, think, and then it kind of came to us like, it's, it's unfortunate because we've been, we've never wanted to share that. My, my kids, because they were too young back then, there's no way they would ever know what we've done and how to do it because it's not documented anywhere. We didn't share it with anyone. So that same weekend, we still decided to go to the conference. We didn't have the luggage or we didn't have any clothes. So we had to do some quick shopping once we, <laughs> once we got to the location. Despite being very sore, we still went. And that's uh, the weekend we decided to, buy, to write a book. Had no intentions on writing a book, but that weekend we're like, let's help other people. Let's document this. And that was the foundation. That's when we started just wanting to help people. So we, we started off just, we didn't really have a name for it. It was just, you know, a couple people here and there. And I did a couple beta programs. And, and, and once I saw the results inside the program and how many people were getting action, it's like, wow, like I'm on a mission to change as many lives as possible. After the car crash, I had a really bad concussion and I was off for a couple of months. And then the time came that I had to go back to work and I had my anxiety was going up or going back. I just didn't want to be there anymore. And the only reason I was able to quit is because I had created my real estate portfolio the year before, and I didn't know I was going to be, you know, from a mental point of view, that kind of bad situation. But I was able to quit my full-time job, and I'm thinking, wow, there's nothing special about Dave and I. We're a regular couple with kids. Um, but if we can do this, I want to help as many other people out there, families, individuals, single women, you know, it doesn't matter who, grow their portfolio as well and, and change their future if they're willing to do so as well. Wow, that's an incredible story. And most people having a near death experience, you know, they, they tend to go and focus on their legacy and their impact at that point. And I'm so glad that that's the, the path that you chose. Cause I know you guys have helped so many people. So I'm so thankful that you guys are okay. And something I think that is interesting about your story, Mel, is, you know, you had to be in the right environment to then have the pathway to then create an education company out of it? Like, how did you know to write a book? Well, you were already plugged into an event, right? And right. so it's kind of like you already had these things in place in your life to have something ca catastrophic happen and then go, well, we're still going to this. And you took action, you know, and I wanted to point that out for everybody listening in because you've got to have those types of things in your life? Like how many conferences are you going to in the next year? How many podcasts are you listening to? How many things are you already committed to that you've already sewn into where when the going gets tough, you're still in on that commitment because, you know, you probably paid money to go to that event. So you're like, well, let's still go. We don't want to, <laughs> we don't want to miss out on it. Right. It was about not giving like, cause I was angry at first. I remember just being very angry uh, the driver, you know, that caused the accident, it was careless driving. And I was, I was angry in the moment. And then I thought, I'm not giving him that much power. The kids are oh. on with the grandparents. And it was almost like, a, you know, like, you're not going to ruin, I'm already sore, you know, the, the vehicles, 
complete total like get, you know not what i expected not what i wanted but you're also not going to ruin my entire weekend out of it so there's a lot of bit, <laughs> a bit about that that anger but i guess changing it into something positive for me like you know what i just des- i still deserve this i survived i meant to be at, at this conference and when we're on vehicle um to get to a new vehicle or the shuttle that picked us up to get to the conference that's what we we just decided we got ourselves in that mindset like let's just make this the most productive i don't know how we're going to attract the best people we're going to connect with people and that's exactly was what happened right i didn't go there thinking i was going to write i had i've never thought about writing a book before zero intentions and all of a sudden we're writing a book <laughs> that's amazing yeah there's so much power in the commitment and i also want to point out sometimes anger is a good thing because it'll push you to do things you know that take you out of your comfort zone or you know push you to still follow through on your commitment because you know, you're pissed at this guy over here. So uh, anger isn't always a bad thing. <laughs> I think I was voting for Mel here. I was like, you know what? I deserve better than than this. And I almost died and that's enough. Like no more, I'm not going to self-pity. I'm going to go and do something for, for me and my husband and my kids. Awesome. So what is your guys' relationship like? Because it sounds like you guys are each other's like motivational speakers or something. Because <laughs> I'm liking this. Like I want to like stay in the life of what your marriage looks like. Yeah. So Dave and I, we are together a lot. We have three kids, so we're very, and my my kids are are active. My little guy's in hockey. And so there's lots going on. So that's always priority. Number one is always where do they, everything fits around their schedule and traveling for their, you know, hockey tournaments or. Oh my, do you know, I have two boys that play hockey too. So I get that life. It's a whole, it's our life. Yeah. Everything. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So it's kind of the schedule of the kids. And then we, we set everything else in between. Um, I mean, yes, we definitely do spend a lot of time together. We, we try to journal together most mornings. We work out together in our gym. And then when it comes to business, although it's our business and it's jointly done, we definitely do divide and conquer. So I love the, the uh, more of the networking and the social media and the marketing and, and the raising funds. And Dave is more into, you know, he geeks out on the accounting and, and on the uh, business structures and lawyers and that kind of stuff. So it's really, we're doing it together, but we also know our strengths um, and weaknesses. I love, I think that's really important to point out because if you were both good at the same thing, it wouldn't be a good partnership in business, right? Because you're, if you're both the one, I want to be the networker, but who, wait, who's going to be over here taking care of the bills and making sure everybody gets paid on time and all that kind of stuff, yeah. you know? So I love that you, you know, and I want everybody to kind of go through this exercise right now. If you have a partner, write out what your strengths are and what are their weaknesses and kind of see, you know, how do we come together and, you know, everybody gets to focus on their strengths instead of trying to fill in on their weaknesses. I think that's really powerful. So you're, you know, starting this amazing, you've had it since 2018. You've had incredible results. I want to hear about one of your favorite student success stories. Oh, you know, I, I, I hate picking this one because I, I have, I have so many of them. Um, the first one that comes to mind, I, I remember being in the kitchen and I, and I went on my laptop and, uh, and, and I just started crying and Dave walks in and he's like, what happened? Like, is everything is okay? And I just, and I get emotional. I just talk about it. She's like, Patricia retired her mom. And I had, to remember, I remember meeting them earlier in the year. She had realized and this is a situation for a lot of people that you didn't, don't have enough money to retire. They were scared, but they pushed their fears. They joined the mentoring program. They they got to work right away. They worked hard, of course. Success doesn't happen unless you take action. So they worked hard. They bought enough properties, and she was able to to retire her mom. And uh, they had filmed the testimonial video, essentially thanking Dave and I. And I just thought it was it was so heartfelt, and it just it, it made me just absolutely like I have the best job in the entire world. I love what I do. The Action Family community, we're a huge community. People support each other and, and just always seeing these results. I feature one of my students every week, but seeing these types of, of results um, is just incredible. What's been the hardest thing about building out an education company? Probably building my team around it behind the scenes. Um, so build, building the team, um, you know, we, Dave and I were around all over social media as investor Mel Dave and, and all those things, but um, they don't see that it's, it's not just Mel here running the show or Dave. It's, we have a very large team uh, behind the scenes, right? So we have a CFO, we have a financial controller, I have a social media division, I have a marketing division, I have a student success division that, that helps us with those, those 
all those things because what really mattered to Dave and I is that we wanted to stay very active with our students. We wanted to be the one replying to their questions because we're the ones that's been there. We're the ones that's, uh, you know, that made a lot of mistakes and also had a lot of success. So we knew that was the foundation of, of our program that we wanted to stay committed and, and show up and all that. So in order to do that, that means all these other, other tasks had to, to be taken care of from somebody else. So it was just really over time creating systems and, and the training manuals and all that kind of stuff. But you know what? I have. Uh, we call them the the action team. We have we have the most amazing action team in, in the world, in my opinion. Like I just could not do any of this with without them. I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs, and they all seem to agree that this is the hardest thing: is finding that talent team. Because when you're starting to scale to eight figures, it's all about the team. You can get to seven figures pretty much on your own, but getting to eight figures, like you've got to have the right people in place. So I'd love to just dive deeper in on that because if you love your team, you're doing something right with your hiring. So give us some tips on how to hire, you know, for the best team. Number one, it probably starts with you. Um, It starts with you as an employer. Set your expectations accordingly. There's no nobody else like you. Nobody's going to care as much about your business and do whatever it takes to make sure everything goes smoothly as much as you. That's likely just a reality. However, there are a lot of people out there that cares and can do an amazing job as well. And and as soon as I realized that even if it's not perfect, even if, oh, I would have worded this this way instead of this way and these little imperfections that as long as it's 80, 85% as good and we can keep making progress and those little errors can be fixed anyhow, it really started from there. And honestly, it was just building one team member and letting go. Like I, I used to do all the cleaning. I used to do the dump runs. Um, I was very, right, as, as a new entrepreneur, I, did, I didn't have money. So I remember scrubbing the toilets and all, doing all that. And the first time I'm like, finally, okay, if I buy one more building, I'm going to use part of that money, that profit and hire a cleaner so I don't have to clean anymore because that's one task that I wanted to delegate. I'm okay, well, I was able to do that. And okay, the next one will be people who do dump runs. And then the next one will be somebody who helps, you know, all these kind of things. And, and just being able to, as I started growing my my team, I love recruiting internally. And what I mean internally is if I have a great team member, I ask them to find me the next you know, version of them. And they've all been amazing um, at, at, at doing that. And the majority of my team members um, came from a, from a referral within the company. Uh, once in a while, it will be outsourced to, to find that specialty, but overall, so a lot of referrals. We have a lot of fun. We, you know, I, I just flew in my, one of my team members from Mexico. We're at an event. So she came with me, same with one of my other team members from Florida. So one's from Mexico, one's from Florida, one was from Ontario. So that way it gives us you know, a chance to meet in person. We do uh, meetings often as well. We have a, a system where we, we communicate all the time. So they still have some, although I'm not necessarily doing all of the work, but they still have, if they have access or they have a questions, there's a funnel that they can kind of more or less get, you know, get to me and, and ask us questions as well. So they still feel involved and, and we celebrate wins. And we, every time one of our students achieve a result, we celebrate it as a team because it's not just Dave and I, it's everybody. So we're just having that, that culture of having, we work really hard, but we play harder. <laughs> I love what you said that it starts with you, right? So in order to attract quality people, you want to be the person that people want to work for, you know? So what are you doing to, you know, within to really be committed to that vision, to want to set an amazing culture? And, you know, you said it, you guys journal together every morning. And I think journaling, like it really helps get the junk out of your mind. It helps you get clear on, okay, what's the vision today? And, you know, it keeps you motivated. And so many people, they resist journaling. Have you seen that, Mel? Mm -hmm. Or they'll do it for a week and then they stop, right? But again, like success leaves clues. If you, if you study a lot of highly successful people, they typically journal. And, and what we mean by journaling is you know, whatever it is, your, your gratitude book, you're grateful for this, or perhaps it's your future goals that you're getting really clarity on. Or I love doing a combination of both. Like I write every day that I'm grateful for my three beautiful, healthy kids. And I have a very close connection with them, right? So that's something that's true and dear to my heart. And then I'll talk about future goals and, and those kind of things. And, and taking that what, 10, 15 minutes away. It gets me focused, uh, thinking positively, remembering how grateful I am for everything that I already have, especially if you have a bad day, which we all do. It's like that foundation. Mm, So good. I call my journal time in the morning a brain dump 
because I don't know what happens in this mind at night, but there I wake up and it just, whoo. so I've found that brain dumping in the morning, I just feel so much clearer. I have such a better day. And it is, it's a mixture of all the things, grateful things I'm scared about. Like, I just like to get it all out. And then I realize, okay, some of the things you're thinking about are never going to happen. So let's just like slash that one out right? and get really clear on what you need to be thinking today, you know? So I love that. I had to point that out because you're right. Success does leave clues. And if all these successful people are writing out their thoughts, there's something to it. So, so good. Okay. So you, we talked about culture, building up the right team. Can you tell me about maybe a mistake that you made in the hiring process and the firing process that, you know, will prevent all of us listening into your wisdom? I think sometimes for me, because we grew very quickly uh, as, a, as both my portfolio were in five countries and we were doing all the, those things and the, the internal team as well. So we grew very quickly. So having everything, for example, KPIs was not my specialty. I'm buying properties. That's my, <laughs> that's my specialty. <laughs> yeah. And realizing that trust but verify, right? Have have some KPIs in place and have the expectations and make sure to that you keep your team accountable. And I think at first I wanted to be the the fun boss and 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 you know like okay next time you know don't submit this by this time and you know let's do it next time and it happens again. Okay next time let's get it right. And okay well you know please remember set yourself a reminder let's do it, right as opposed to okay what well, this is the expectation and 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 if this keeps occurring then you know we we need to figure out something here as well because otherwise sometimes that will happen that they may not take their, their job seriously or, or whatnot, or, or maybe they don't even know. My expectations in my head is that you need to do this, 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 but without any proper KPIs communicated properly, they have mm-hmm. no clue that I'm expecting these things. So now we're getting a lot better at, at the KPIs. We're getting a lot better at communicating on, okay, these are the tasks that I expect you to do, for example, in a day. And this is different in every role. Of course, I don't do this with every position, but certain positions, these are the 20 things that need to be accomplished. And then at the end of the day, having a report. So that way, even if I'm not necessarily communicating with that person, they report back to their manager and I get a report if I want to look at something. So, and they're self-accountable, right? They, they have to fill it out every day. So that way they can say, oh, no, I, I missed it. Or I didn't get to this because this emergency happened. So it just keeps the expectations and the communication there as well. And, and then it gives me the opportunity as well as uh, owner of the company to go back and look at things as well and identify gaps. Well, maybe, oh, okay, wait a second. There's three people here doing the same thing. Like, why are we doing it this way? Mm-hmm. Or, or maybe this person, you know, they're, they're having a really hard time with this task because maybe the onboarding wasn't pr- perfect or I need to have this person spend more time with them. So it just helps really identify gaps as well. Mm, I, I, I mean, the KPI is everything. I stress this so much with my clients and, and I feel like this is another thing that people resist too, because they're like, well, you know, how many KPIs can one person have? And I really try to say one, like everybody should own at least one KPI, but everything should show that what they're doing is bringing in more revenue. So, you know what I mean? I don't know how you pick yours, Mel, but I always try to say, okay, if this is the KPI that you're owning, how is it directly related to the revenue and showing them that like, this is why this matters to me, you know? So anyways, I can go on a tangent about KPIs, but I got excited. Kayla, <laughs> I love that though. And you're bang on. You need to show your team why what they're doing matters because then they'll naturally like anybody else, it's human nature. They're going to care more, right? If, if, if I just say, oh, you know, please make sure it's really important that you respond within 20 to 48 hours. You know, if you can't, for whatever reason, at least, you know, reply and say something. And they might just think like, oh, okay, well, Melanie's just being difficult or particular. But if I explain the logic behind that and, and why it's important to do so, then it's a, it's a different avenue. Mm-hmm. So good. So let's get back into real estate investing, because I, I see that is like what you are the most passionate about. What was your mindset shift that had to happen from your first property to now the properties you're acquiring? Like, how do you think differently about acquiring a property? Yeah, I mean, there's a few things. Like, I mean, the the growth piece of it, like I remember being in my 30s and and I was a single mom back then. I remember running and listening to 10X and all those things. I had set myself a goal that by 40, I'm going to have 10 units or 10 properties. And I was very vocal at first about my goal. And I was telling everyone and, and not everyone, but, I, you know, people I would speak with, 
And then all of a sudden came the, the naysayers of the, why would you want to do that? And you're, my uncle lost it all. And you know, the, the, the toilets and the plumbing and all that. And then I just decided, no, you know what, like higher, more successful people are, would be cheering me on. Right. And I started listening instead to those people. And then by the time I had, I turned 40, I had 29 buildings. So mindset was number one. And then using creative financing strategies at the end of the day, I didn't have that much money either. Like the majority of us, when we get started and by leveraging other people's money. So we do owner financing or secret funds or promissory notes. I didn't have to come up with my down payment anymore. I don't, I didn't have to come up with my own money for renovations or closing costs, right? So it was just a game changer because I was able, instead of buying one property every couple of years, I was able to accelerate that. And then that's when we, our, our business really grew. And over a while, you know, we really wanted to start uh, over time. We really wanted to start diversifying our portfolio and going into different countries. And, and it was the same thing, making sure that I have the right team members in different countries, right? The right lawyer insurance, mm -hmm. all those things in place and getting connected. And then also pushing through that fear, like, oh, okay, I'm, all of a sudden I'm going to Costa Rica buying properties. So it was a combination of, of the mindset along with a lot of determination, of course. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow. You know, it's, it's incredible to me how we underestimate what we can do, you know, in five years and we overestimate what we can do in a year, yep. but you know, you know how people get that way. It's like, oh, I think we're going to be able to accomplish so much. And the ramp up takes more time than people think it's going to take. Don't well, would think you about how that? many times you do a to do list in one day and it's never completed. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But if you really just stay committed and Mel is living proof of that, you just stay committed, stay the course. Once you build up momentum, and this is not just in real estate investing, it's in really any industry. Once you build up the momentum, things start to happen faster. You're, now she's at 29 buildings. She didn't say 29 doors. She's at 29 buildings. You guys like that is incredible when all she wanted was 10 doors by the time she was 40. So that is mind blowing to me. And people need to take your story and just really use it to fill up their hope cup. We talk about that hope cup all the time. That's why it's powerful to listen to podcasts, to read the books, because when you're just talking to your friends who have never done it, you're of course going to feel hopeless all the time because you're not <laughs> being inspired. But when you listen to the greats like Mel, you're going, oh yeah, okay. If it's possible for her, it could be possible for me. And she used creative financing. People are going, okay, when they hear creative financing, some of my audience is going to think that that's just seller financing and they haven't really probably been, I haven't talked at all about like private money, hard money on this podcast. So tell me when you say creative financing, what do you mean? Yeah. So creative financing, essentially I do use three different ways of doing it. And before I explain those ones, like we make it a win-win people. Why would anybody want to do this? They don't know you because it benefits them. So, mm -hmm. um, so go into it with this mindset, but yes, essentially you need 20, 25, maybe 30% down when you get into some income properties as the down payment, we can't change that. However, it doesn't have to be your own money. So we use seller financing where the owner holds the financing for you. Why would they do that? Because it benefits them. I do it on four of my properties that I sold because it helps me out from a capital gains point of view, for example. We can also use somebody's 401k or secured funds as well, where if they're not happy with their return, they're not going to be pulling it out because that wouldn't make sense, of course, but they can, they can um, invest it in real estate where they can get a higher profit, for example, and promissory notes where not everybody out there wants to be an investor like I am and finding deals and overseeing the projects, but there's people that have money. Maybe they, their house, their own house went up in value and they have money sitting there. Not it's that money. It's not making them any money and they want to invest it, for example, with me and, and I can give them a nice return. And then I'm able to get into the deals without using my own funds. So I know that was a lot of information because you're going like, whoa, there are so many ways that you can get involved in real estate. And if you happen to be one of those people that you're like, I don't want to be an active real estate investor. I don't want to go out. I don't want to find the deals. I want to talk to that person that is listening in right now. Why would they invest with somebody like you, Mel, somebody like me that has a good deal that could, you know, have their money make way more money than their bank is making for them in their savings account right now. How do they go about vetting those people that they're going to be investing with? Like, what should they do? Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, you should make sure that number one, 
you need to make money, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. right? So you want the interest rate to, to, to be fair. You want to make sure that they have their exit strategy. I talk about exit strategy all the time, exit before you enter. You need to know how whoever you're investing with are going to be paying you back, whether it's in a year from now or five years from now or two years from now. So you need to know, so it's not just about the interest. If somebody offers you 15% or 18% interest, well, that's great, but are you ever going to see your money again? So most importantly, the foundation is, do they have an exit strategy? So make sure that's very, very clear to you. And it's in the numbers. I mean, it, it, it needs to be strategic. It needs to be numerical. It needs to be in the numbers. I use my matrix where it's, it's black and white. I can see my, my exit strategy or not. So make sure of that. And then if you need to, especially at the beginning, if you don't know the person, get, get some updates, right? So if they borrowed $100,000 for renovations, you know, along the way, you're going to want to see some progress pictures, for example, um, especially if you're, you're, you're brand new into it and it doesn't take very long. I have investors now that's been with me forever and we don't need to talk often because they're like, Mel, I don't want to hear from you. Just keep paying me. Right, made the check. As yeah. well, yep. And then, you know, make sure they, they have a, a good reputation as well. Or if they don't, if they're brand new, it doesn't mean you can't invest with them. I had my first, first person invest with me as well with my first creative deal. We, every single one of us did. So it doesn't mean it's a no. However, make sure they know what they're doing. You know, what, what did they do to prepare themselves? Did they get some kind of coaching where they learned about real estate? If they're going to own hundreds of thousands or millions in real estate, you would think it's worth for them to, to invest, make sure they're doing it properly. So these are things even for myself when, when I invest with other people that, that I make sure they have as well. What's your outlook right now on the economy and how that's affecting, you know, the real estate deals that you're doing? Yeah, I mean, the economy definitely has changed, although because I've always used creative financing, the interest rate for me has always been higher. 8% is something I've been dealing with for, for many years. So that hasn't really changed. Uh, some of the Landlord Tenant Board Act in certain areas we were investing are stricter. So that's why we're really going into markets as much as possible where returns are best and it's landlord friendly. So that definitely helps as well. But there's still definitely deals out there. It really is about getting into the market. So maybe you're not going to cash flow as much as, as three years ago. And that's the reality. And, and we can't change that, although there's always deals. But it's also time in the market and, and realizing that if you get on the chart over time, value of the property will be going up and increasing. So it's not just about today's cash flow. It's also about these appreciation that you're going to be getting over time as well. Mm -hmm. I love that you pointed that out. And, you know, the best way to beat inflation is to control your earning power. And becoming an investor is one way that you could pull the level, the lever on your earning power, right? So even though cash flow might be a little down, I know in multifamily here in, in the US, people are feeling it. But what I do love is that you also are getting the experience and maybe go, okay, I might want to become an active real estate investor myself because people like Mel, I know for me, people that invest with me, I'm giving constant updates no matter what, just teaching them along the way. Because the more you're educated about a topic and about the market, the more empowered you're going to feel to continue to invest. So that's one thing I want to point out. Like if you are going to invest and have your money work hard for you, make sure you're going to go in with somebody that is also committed to being a teacher to you, because I think that's like super important. I remember when I first started investing like years ago, 10 years ago, and I invested with the wrong people who kind of talked condescending to me, even though I was the one with the money, you know, give, <laughs> giving it to them. And I'm like, that should have been a red flag that they acted like I was an idiot all the time. And I was, I wasn't that, I, I wasn't skilled, you know, <laughs> but anyways, I, I think that's like another thing to point out. And in this market, you could find a lot of people that are like that, that can, you know, kind of be a little condescending. And so I just want to point that out too, you know. No, that's a great <laughs> point, Kayla. And and you we well, want to make sure if you're the investor using other people's money to do this as well, you're bang on like treating them if they don't understand something, they should. And you should know that they understand it because otherwise words going to get around very quickly. And it's absolutely fascinating how many times this happened to me where somebody will lend me X amount of money and they may not be quite as much as I want and we'll do a one-year term or two-year term. And I'm a huge believer. I always pay them back. Even if they say, keep my money, let's do it again. Yep, I will. But I want that transaction out of my account, yes. back in my account. 
just to show them that no, I did actually have an exit plan. I'm not, I'm not just reusing your money over and over again. Mm -hmm. And yeah, paying them on time. Don't miss a payment. Communicate with them. Pay them back when you're set, even if you're going to reuse money. And so often we had just had somebody this weekend who has been a lender with us and said, okay, now I'm ready to put another big chunk in. I'm like, oh, that, you know, didn't, I thought she was max because she's done that quite a few times. She just keeps having this, this pool of money coming her way that, you know, she wants to continue to invest because she knows I pay her on time. I pay her well, and I always pay her back before we do the next one. Mm, so good. Okay. So go out, moral of the story and invest your money. And I want to point out that I'm an affiliate with Directed IRA. So you guys can go to directedira.com forward slash craft. And if you don't have your retirement set up to be, you know, self-directed, I highly recommend it. You guys can have a free call with them. And I know several of my listeners have done that and had ex- incredible results going and putting it into alternative assets. And it's still crazy to me that real estate is considered an alternative asset. <laughs> That's crazy to me. But anyways, I love that you do that too, Mel. It's awesome. Okay. So right now, like you said, there's always a way to find a deal. You've been paying 8% interest for a while. I was going to ask you that when you do take money from a private money lender, is it always one thing like, okay, it's 8% all the time that you're going to pay them back? Or do you always change it up? Always change it up. <laughs> so when I said 8%, I just meant comparing it, say, to the banks or, or whatnot. But no, I've had 0% interest for some owner finance deal because they did it for the bigger picture of of capital gains and whatnot. I've paid 3%, I've paid 5%, I've paid 8%, I've paid double digits as well. And it literally does come down to the deal, the performance of it, um, what can the deal sustain, right? So I need to make sure that my overall ratios, financial ratios in the, in, in the, in the investment world continues to make sense. So I can continue to receive yes from the, from the lenders and that I have my exit strategy as well. If I sometimes, if I put it too high, I'm setting myself up for failure where I'm not able to do that. Now, that being said, there's a lot of different ways to actually structure your deal as well, where I may not be able to pay you quite as much interest right now, but I can do a balloon strategy where it kind of balloons and, and more interest in the end. So this is where you put creative into the creative financing and can structure your deal where you're still cash flowing because you should be cash flowing from day one and your lenders feel comfortable, but they also benefit from, from doing a transaction with you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we just did a large seller financing deal in Phoenix, Arizona on a 432 unit apartment building. And people go, they were mind blown when I was doing like investor calls. What, why, why would he do that? And it's because people that's doing him a favor (laughs) because if he has to cash out on a hundred million dollar capital gains, because he's had the property for so long, it's a big, big check he's writing to the, to the government. So I, you know, part of this is like getting into you're helping people with their tax-free wealth. And also for you as well, there's so many benefits. Again, I'm not an accountant or anything like that. So I don't give, you know, legal advice here. But when you become an investor in real estate, there are benefits that your government will give you. And I, there's a book I have, oh my gosh, I can't remember who it's by. You might know it, Mel, where he talks about the benefits in every single country the tax benefits. Tom Wheelwright is his name. His first book was called Tax-Free Wealth. It is so good. And he just came out with another one where it goes into like depth. I mean, it is like taking a course. It's crazy how much goodness is in this book. And he goes by country, you know, all the benefits. And I was like, gosh, I haven't done anything outside of the U S and that's my next question for you, Mel is what made you want to go? I know you're in Canada, but what made you want to go into five different countries and how did you get well-versed in the laws in those countries? Yeah. And, and, uh, you kind of said it, I'm not an accountant, I'm not a lawyer and I don't pretend I am either. So I knew that I needed to find the right people in these different countries in order to do it properly. Cause I don't know what I don't know. So that mm-hmm. was number one really. And it was, just came from being in the real estate world for many, many years. I have people in, in, uh, in Canada that are now in Costa Rica, for example, that I was able to, to connect with. So just uh, having a large network definitely worked. A lot of the strategies that I'm using are the same. So one deal, for example, in Costa Rica was owner financing with a promissory note. So it's the same types of strategies that I would use here in Canada. Nothing changed. Uh, They still wanted to do it. I still, they paid half my closing costs. We negotiated that. So a lot of those strategies are the same, but when it comes to the business structure and making sure there's no 
regulations that I'm not aware of. That's where, of course, the accountants and lawyers and investor focused agent uh, representing you there is really, really important. And then, of course, you need to have the property management. And in those countries, like in Costa Rica, Mexico, and Dominican, where we're doing more short term rentals in, in those areas. But um, yeah, just being able to, to more or less apply the same strategies that I got really comfortable and an expert at here and start doing it in, in the States in different areas as well. How often do you go visit those out of the country properties? The ones in, let's say, Costa Rica, for example. We purchased them without seeing them at first, but I did my due diligence, of course. So you don't have to necessarily see it as long as you have somebody seeing it, somebody doing- Somebody on the ground, yeah. Exactly. So I'm on the ground doing their, you know, due diligence, building the team, right? But we did go to Costa Rica a couple, couple of times, which is part of the reason why we decided to go to different countries. We, we love traveling. Dave and I are, are huge travelers. We're always traveling. We uh, travel with the kids often, of course, as well, because they're, they're young, young enough that they're able to travel with us. And um, yeah, being able to go and we stay at our, at our property, which is a lot of fun and do activities. Of course, it's a, it's a big a tax advantage because you got to check out <laughs> your property. And then you can do little things like, okay, this, you know, maybe change this or change that type of thing as well. Wow. That's so fun. Now you're making me want to do it. I, one of my friends, Vina, she's also one of my business partners. She was just in Puerto Rico and she's huge on you know, investing in Puerto Rico right now. And I'm like, okay. I just, I don't see the draw. I never want to leave my little bubble in Newport beach here, but you know, maybe it'd be fun to travel the world and own the, own the piece that you're going to go visit. I see it. <laughs> okay, Mel. Well, I had such an amazing time. I feel like I was quizzing you on all of the things, just like hearing your feedback and, you know, your heart about helping people win in their lives. It's so honorable. Where do you see yourself and your family in the next five years? Oh, that's a great, great question. I just want to continue to have a lot of fun. My kids and, and, and my family are always a, the number one. So I want to always keep that priority. Number one is, is you know, be there for my kids and, and travel and do some fun things with them. So, and then continue to grow my portfolio. Um, I love, I love uh, growing our portfolio in different areas as well. We're investing um, quite a bit, really focused in the States right now. So Texas and Florida and Arizona and different areas there as well. And of course, continuing to, to change lives with our Action Family Mentoring Program. Wow. Okay. Well, I'm so excited. We're going to make sure to link up all of your stuff in the show notes. Where can people find you? Like, where do you like hanging out the most? I'm all over social media. So we're on Instagram, we're on Facebook, we're on YouTube, we're on TikTok. So we are all over. Yeah, all over. It's always Investor Mel Dave. So if you follow us on different channels, we do post different content on different channels. And and if you're interested and if you're like, okay, Mel, I kind of like this whole real estate, but this was way too much, way too quickly. I know it's so much in in the quick little information. I can send you, if you DM me on social media, I can give you a little mastermind class that kind of shows you some numbers attached to it if if you're visual like I am. Awesome. Okay, well, thank you so much, Mel, for being on the show. I know everybody's gonna love it. Thank you so much, Kayla.